The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Welcome back, everybody, to AO3. Um, very happy to see you again. So, as you can see from the slides, we will continue the discussion from last time. We were talking about interference phenomena, which involve two or multiple uh, point-like source, and they actually uh, interact with each other and uh, produce interesting phenomena, which we see with laser, with uh, water ripples, and also uh, we discuss how to design a phase uh, radar together. And the one thing which we learned is that if you, for example, have two slit interference, okay, and if you look at the intensity of the resulting uh, interference pattern as a function of uh, angle, you will see that there are peaks, uh, uh, periodic peaks uh, as a function of angle. And we also know how to calculate uh, well, where will be the principal uh, maxima, will be the minima, which will have destructive interference between the two point-like source. Okay, so as usual, we go from one electromagnetic wave to two electromagnetic wave and to an electromagnetic wave. And today, we are going to do infinite number of electromagnetic wave, and they are going to uh, uh, Integrate each other or superpose uh, infinite number of uh, electromagnetic waves all together. And that brings us to the discussion of uh, diffraction. Okay, so what are we going to talk about today is, uh, for example, a point like source, a laser pointer, and what will be the image of a laser pointer look like uh, when this laser pass through a single slit or uh, you know, just the laser itself, the laser beam itself, what will, what will happen to this laser beam. And also, we will talk about, we will make some comments on the Star Trek, for example, right? They have this super weapon, which, you know, they shoot enemy with, enemy with uh, this laser beam. And we'll see how practical that is by the end of this course, all right? And the third thing is that it's related to resolution. So we are going to design a phone screen of the your mobile phone together, all right, to see what is actually practical, what is actually not practical, all right? Um, if Yenji is opening a new company to develop a phone, what should be the requirement for the, for the screen, for example, which I'm not going to do it. <laughs> all right, so uh, this is actually what we are going to discuss today. So we are interested in a situation where you have plane wave, and those plane waves are approaching from the left hand side of the screen toward a single slit. So basically, uh, the setup is like this. So you have uh, those wave front, uh, front uh, basically is uh, traveling to the right hand side, the plane waves, and on the wall, there's a, there's a, um, there's a slit or a hole, which is actually uh, opening and uh, the waves can actually penetrate through this hole. The width of this uh, hole is uh, 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 denoted by, or, or is actually uh, uh, given uh, to you, which is actually D. And uh, we were wondering what is going to happen to, uh, uh, to the, uh, what, we, what, what are we going to observe on the screen, which is actually uh, pretty far away from the wall, and uh, this screen is actually uh, 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 used to uh, actually uh, 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 to uh, uh, observe uh, the pattern of the interference pattern of the uh, electromagnetic wave passing this uh, uh, this hole. Okay. So as we discussed last time, uh, due to Huygens' principle. Okay, every point, okay, is actually like a, a, a point-like source of a spherical waves, right? So you, as you can see now, we actually consider the sizable slit, 
Therefore, uh, there must be a lot of point-like source inside uh, in, in, in this slit, right? When, when this uh, wet front is pass through uh, this wall, there should be infinite number of point-like source, all right? And all of them, due to uh, Huygens' principle, is going to be like point-like source of spherical waves. And they are all emitting uh, from all those uh, possible locations, and they are overlapping each other, and they have constructive or destructive interference with each other, okay? So that is actually what is happening with uh, uh, the single slit experiment. And we call them diffraction, all right? So we may be wondering why do I call it diffraction? Why not interference, right? Because it's basically the same phenomena, right? So I think it's just a matter of wording. Uh, Feynman actually commented on this. And he said that nobody, uh, nobody was able to define the difference between diffraction and the interference uh, in a satisfactory way, which is actually true. It's just a matter of wording. So we are looking at exactly the same phenomena when we actually discuss this experiment. Okay, so what I'm going to do today is now to introduce you the way we can deal with this. I'm sure you have seen this experiment before, uh, maybe in AO2 or in high school days. Uh, on the other hand, what we are going to do today is to really uh, make use of the mathematics which we have learned uh, from uh, 1803 or from the previous lectures to attack this problem. Okay, so what is actually the mathematics I am going to use today? So the the, the mathematics which I would like to use to attack this problem is to use a two-dimensional Fourier transform, okay? I think by now, you should not be afraid of Fourier transform anymore. It should be pretty natural. It's just an integration, and then you evaluate, and then you are going to get the corresponding uh, number whatsoever. But the, the cool thing is that it, AO3 give the physical meaning of those numbers, and I'm going to talk about that. So, what is actually the Fourier transform I'm going to use? So I'm going to evaluate C, which is a function of Kx and the Ky, okay? And what is actually this C function? This C function is equal to one over four pi squared, which I really don't care too much, it's just a constant. All right, and uh, I do uh, integration from minus infinity to infinity for the dx, and I do an uh, integration from minus infinity to infinity dy, a small uh, uh, length scale dy, and I have a f function, which I will introduce you what the f function mean, what does the f function actually present, and the exponential minus i, k is the, uh, uh, the vector which is actually telling you the direction of the propagation of the uh, spherical wave times r, which is actually the, the, uh, a function of x and y, all right? And this is actually the kind of integration which we will employ e to, uh, in order to attack the problem we are interested uh, 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 in, in, in this uh, lecture. So. What does this integration mean? So we have basically uh, uh, some kind of, uh, of uh, this, this uh, two-dimensional uh, 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 Fourier transform. The f function is actually telling you the shape of the source, okay? So basically, this is actually telling you about the shape of the source. Right? As we, we, as we as we discussed before, the shape of the source, uh, every point on this point uh, on, on this shape, is a, a source of spherical wave, right? By Huygens principle, right? So that is actually telling you where should I do the integration. All right. This one exponential i k dot r. What does what is that? This is actually telling you about 
the spherical wave, right? So, so remember, we were doing uh, two slit interference before, and we have actually two exponential function, right? If you remember from last lecture, okay? So now, this is actually put there because each source, you are going to get an exponential function, which is actually presenting the propagation of the electromagnetic wave. Okay, you, you can say that, oh, wait, wait, wait. The, the omega t disappeared, right? There's no omega t here, right? But I don't really care because everybody is actually oscillating at the same frequency at, at the same phase, right? Therefore, I factorize R out, okay? After I have done all the calculation, I can multiply the whole thing by cosine omega t plus some phi. Then actually that is actually modulating and oscillating up and down as the, as the uh, uh, prime wave as you approach the, 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 the wall, right? So therefore, I actually already factorized uh, out, all right? So this is actually telling you about the electric field and the, what is actually here. This is actually the uni area. You are performing this integration, right? And you can actually do integration over the full universe, right? So, so you have a plan which actually extends to the whole full, full universe. But that what is actually really contributing is defined by this f function, which is actually the shape of the source, okay? And some normalization factor, which I don't really care too much. All right, so this looks really fancy. And, uh, but it's actually uh, not that fancy. And what the product uh, you are getting here is some C function. It's a C is actually the function of Kx and the Ky. What is Kx and Ky? It's actually telling you the direction uh, of propagation, right? The K vector is actually telling you the correction of the propagation. If you evaluate C with a specific given, as given uh, the x and the kx and ky, basically you are evaluating uh, the total electric field, okay, going some direction, which is actually defined by kx and ky. All right. So the big picture is the following. So basically, you have some source can looks like this in the x y plane. This is x and y plane. Okay. Right. All those, uh, all those things, all those points, all those little areas inside this hole is a spherical wave source. Right. And the f function actually define the shape of this hole, and this integration. Okay, it's actually integrating over all those little areas and calculate the contribution from each small area, sum them together. Then finally, you are getting something which is actually a function of kx and ky. What is kx and ky? It's actually giving you the direction of propagation from this point like source to a uh, to observer p, all right? And this c function is actually proportional to the total electric field, okay? So you can see that, huh, we have learned this Fourier transform from the math department, and we give life to this, right, to this function, right? Now, actually, we understand what we are doing now. We are actually really summing all over the uh, summing over, over the, uh, the available point like source, and add all the contribution of the electromagnetic wave together, then what we are getting, the C function, is actually uh, proportional to the total electric field. All right? So that is actually the big picture. Any questions so far? Okay, I hope you can actually understand what we are doing. So now, what I'm going to do is to really use this uh, uh, formula and uh, 
uh, attack the problem we are, which we are actually trying to understand, the single slit problem, all right? So suppose I have a single slit, which looks like this, okay? I'm running in this thing maybe 100 times, okay, 1,000 times, all right? And this is actually the wall, okay? It's very, very long, okay? I would like to define first my coordinate system. The x direction, as I actually draw from, from there, is actually pointing upward. The y direction is actually parallel to the wall, all right? And the z direction is actually going toward the screen, which I am trying to display the outcome of this experiment, all right? And the distance between these two walls is actually d, which is actually uh, given there, all right? So I would like to actually understand what is going to happen when the plane waves pass through this uh, single slit, all right? Therefore, before I calculate the C function proportional to the total electric field, what I really need is a functional form, F, which describes this uh, single slit, right? And uh, just to make sure that everybody's on the same page, this wall is actually infinitely long from minus infinity in Y to positive infinity Y, all right? So it's actually a super long wall, and uh, they, these two uh, 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 edge is actually, uh, the distance between the, the, the edges is actually d, all right? So what would be the f function, which describes the shape of the, the, the light source? f function is a function of x and y, and uh, I define a f function, and I give you this f functions to describe the experimental setup. So the f function can be either one, which actually shows that, okay, there are point-like source there, or zero when I am talking about things on the wall, all right? Because there's no point-like source there, all right? Because the wall is actually blocking the, uh, the, the light, all right? So, so it can be either one or zero. When is that equal to one? When minus d over two, all right? If I define this is actually x equal to zero, the middle of the slit is actually x equal to zero, then it is actually equal to one when minus d over two smaller than or equal to x smaller or equal to d over two, right? So that will give you a slit uh, with width of capital D, right? On the other hand, if the absolute value of x is greater than a d over two, then I get zero, all right? So now you can see that actually that is actually the meaning of f function, right? f function is actually giving you a map of the point-like source, all right? And what I'm going to do now is to really do the integration to sum over all the spherical uh, electromagnetic uh, waves coming from all those point-like source and calculate the total electric field. All right, so now I can go ahead and calculate C function, which is actually a function of kx and ky, related to the direction of propagation, or say the relative uh, 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 position of the observer and the, the overall point-like source. All right, and this is actually equal to one over four pi squared, according to my formula. And now I'm going to uh, do an integration from minus the infinity to infinity. But I found that there's a shortcut I can take. Fxy is only non-zero between minus d over two and the plus d over two in the x direction, right? Therefore, this integration becomes integration from minus d over two to positive d over two dx exponential minus i kx times x, 
right? I'm taking part of the k vector dot r out of this formula, right? The relevant, the relevant part related to x uh, direction integration is exponential i k x times x, all right? And now I can actually do the integration in the y direction, all right? So you can see that in the y direction, this lead is infinitely long, right? Covering the left hand side, from the left hand side edge of the, the universe to the right hand side of the edge of the universe, really long, super long. Five minus infinity to infinity, all right? In the x, in the y direction, sorry, all right? The relevant part of the exponential minus k dot r is exponential minus i k y times y. All right. So before I do this integration, I would like to remind you one thing which is actually we have learned from the past from the help of math department. So we know delta function x minus a is actually equal to 1 over 2 pi integration from minus infinity to infinity exponential i p x minus a dp. All right? So we know about this uh, formula. So that means I can easily evaluate this function. So this function, I am actually doing the integration over y. Therefore, what I'm going to get is I take 1 over 2 pi out of this. Okay, I take 2 pi out of this. Then basically, I can actually arrive expression, which is actually delta function. It's a function of ky. After you do this integration using this formula here, so p here is actually y in, in my integration I'm doing. And, uh, and what I'm going to get is actually ky equal to 0, I simpl uh, uh, minus 0, and I simplify that to be delta function of ky, all right? So basically, you are going to get the y, ky contribution is going to give you a delta function, all right? So how about uh, the, the integration which is uh, the other part of the integration. The other part of the integration is related to x direction. You see it, right? So basically, what is actually left over? I took already 1 over 2 pi from here, all right? Therefore, I have 1 over 2 pi, all right? And I do the integration. It's just an exponential function. I'm not super worried. Basically, I get 1 divide 1 di uh, over minus i kx, right? Exponential minus i kx, x. And evaluate it at d over 2, x equal to d over 2, and x equal to minus d over 2. All right? I think, I hope this part is straightforward enough. Any questions so far? Everybody is following? All right, very good. So I will continue the red part. So I will just look at the red part and then continue on this board, okay? I'm using the red pen, right? So, all right. So, so basically, what I'm going to get is basically you have 1 over 2 pi, 1 over um, minus i kx, right? Exponential minus i k uh, x d over 2, right? Minus exponential i k x d over 2. All right, so the red part of the that function becomes this. And you can actually easily realize that this is actually uh, proportional to a sine uh, function, right? So basically, I'm going to get 1 over 2 pi minus 2i sine kx d over 2, right? 
divided by um, i k x. Okay, this is actually coming from there, and uh, this is actually coming from this minus two i sine theta uh, sine function is coming from the exponential function. I can cancel this to, and basically I get one over pi k x sine k x d divided by two. Okay, so if I put everything together, so basically what you are getting is delta function of k y. All right, one over pi k x sine k x d over two. And I get uh, and I going too fast. Everybody is following? OK. So I hope this mathematics is straightforward enough. And uh, don't forget what we are doing. So what we are doing is the following. So we have this two-dimensional Fourier transform. And the, the, the goal is to sum over all the, so the waves coming from a shape defined by f function. And I'm going to evaluate the c function, and the c function is proportional to the total electric field. All right? C is a function of kx and ky. kx and ky give you the information about the direction, relative uh, 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 position of the source and uh, the, uh, the, the observer p. All right? And from this exercise, what we actually learned from here is that the C function is a function of y, but it's actually only non-zero when ky, uh, KY is equal to what? Zero, right? Does that surprise you? No, probably not. Right? Why is that? Why should we expect that? Because in the y direction, this slit is infinitely long. All right? So if you have contribution of many, many spherical waves, all right, and this thing is infinitely long, the, the sum of all those spherical waves is going to be still like a wave front. Right? You can do this in your, your head. So that means the direction. If, if I choose a direction which is actually pointing to uh, somewhere which is actually uh, with a ky not equal to zero, so that means I have a specific direction, what I'm going to get is that the electric field, the total electric field, will be equal to zero, right? And of course, you can actually also uh, uh, talk about what will happen in the x direction. So that is actually the, the dependence of the c function to the kx, right? And we found interesting dependence. It's actually sine kx d over 2 divided by kx. So what I'm going to do is to make our life slightly easier by defining something which is actually uh, easier to, uh, to understand, all right? But before that, I would like to say that the electric field, as I mentioned before, is going to be proportional to the C function, all right? And now I would like to drop the y direction because it's just a delta function, right? Therefore, I can actually drop it in the discussion. So then I will say that this electric field is going to be proportional to the sine kx d over 2 divided by kx. Since we have the electric field, uh, the, the magnitude of the electric field, then I can actually calculate what will be the intensity. Right? Intensity is actually what we care. It's going to be proportional to e squared. And that is actually proportional to c squared. And what is actually that value? That is going to be proportional to 
sine square kx d divided by 2 divided by kx squared. Any questions so far? All right. So remember what is actually we are discussing. So we are discussing about a single slit, and we were wondering what will happen to uh, an observer point P uh, when they actually look at, when, when this observer look at uh, the, uh, the interference pattern of all the uh, point-like source between these uh, two walls, all right? We can actually uh, make it much more understandable by using angle, which is actually theta, which is the measure of AP, which is the direction of the, uh, 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 which is a vector connecting the, the slit to the observer to the horizontal direction. And I can define the displacement uh, with respect to the center to be uh, x. And I can actually uh, also uh, express AP by a vector which is R vector. Basically, after this definition, we can actually calculate or express sine theta. Since, since the distance between uh, 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 the, uh, the screen and the wall is very, very large. Therefore, the theta angle is very small, right? Therefore, I can safely assume that sine theta is actually x divided by r, all right? And also, at the same time, this is actually equal to kx divided by k, right? Because the k vector is actually telling you the direction of a propagation, right? So therefore, I can actually rewrite this. This will become kx. Uh, the, the, the magnitude of k vector is actually the two, uh, uh, basically 2 pi over lambda, right? So therefore, you can actually calculate that. Then you will get getting kx times lambda divided by 2 pi, all right? Therefore, uh, the goal is to rewrite kx in the form which we understand, which is theta. Right? So now we have achieved that. Right? What is actually kx? kx is actually equal to 2 pi sine theta divided by lambda. OK? And this means that my, in, uh, my intensity, which I obtained, uh, uh, is, uh, obtained it there, will be proportional to sine squared pi d divided by lambda sine theta divided by 2 pi sine theta divided by lambda squared. So basically, what I'm doing is to replace kx and then write it in terms of theta. All right? If I define beta to be equal to, to, be equal to pi d, sine theta over lambda, OK? If I define this, basically, you are getting sine square beta. This will be proportional to sine square beta divided by beta square. And this beta is actually proportional to uh, theta and, uh, and the d. Any questions so far? I'm just doing a uh, replace. I'm just replacing uh, uh, the variables so that actually it's actually in terms of theta and uh, in terms of some variable which actually simplify the expression dramatically. Okay? So that's very good. So we have actually evaluated the intensity, uh, the resulting intensity of, uh, of the uh, which will, will show up on the screen. And we found that it's actually proportional to sine square uh, pi d divided by lambda sine theta divided by something squared. 
and I call this uh, uh, constant, uh, sorry, sorry, call this expression, uh, I define this expression to be beta, then the function of form becomes much simpler. It's becoming sine squared beta divided by beta squared. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is to visualize this, uh, this result, right? So what I'm trying to do now is to plot the intensity i as a function of sine theta, for example, right? Using this expression. So what I'm going to get is something which is actually going to be decreasing. Something is going to be decreasing as a function of beta, right? So that's the dashed line. This dashed line is actually proportional to 1 over beta squared, right? At sine theta, at sine theta uh, very small, you actually uh, reach a maxima value of I0. When you move away from, uh, uh, from uh, theta equal to 0, you actually will hit a minima when the sine theta is equal to Lambda of, uh, lambda over d, right? Because if a sine theta is equal to lambda over d, then this expression become what? Become what value? When sine theta is equal to lambda over d? Pi, right? Sine pi is zero, right? Therefore, you have a, construct, a, a, a destructive interference, OK? This point is really interesting. Why? Because that means all the point-like source, OK, all of them between these uh, two walls are working together so nicely such that the total field is completely canceled. Isn't that remarkable? Right? That's a really, really crazy when this happens. Right? Takes a lot of work, infinite number of source to do that. Then, if you actually increase further the sine theta, move away from uh, the center uh, of the uh, the screen, basically you see that this will increase again and reach a max, uh, uh, smaller maxima, and again reach zero. When this is actually equal to two lambda over d, and this pattern continues. And of course, because of the, symmet uh, the symmetry uh, we observe in this expression, everything is actually proportional to sine squared uh, something, right? Therefore, this distribution is actually symmetric. So you have minus lambda over d, minus 2 lambda over d, et cetera, et cetera. Any questions so far? OK, so what you can see here is something really interesting. Sine theta, OK, if you multiply that by r, it's telling you the, the, the position which you will see on the screen, right? So this is actually, if you are interested in some place, uh, a point of interest p, and this is actually just r times sine theta. And this is actually the sleep. All right. And I will move this thing closer here. And the, the size of this slit is called d. OK? So one thing which is actually very interesting in this result is that if you look at the width of the, uh, 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 the central a principal maxima, OK? The width is actually the measure between the center and the first minima, where you have completely destructive interference, OK? What you actually see here is that this is actually something very interesting is happening. When you increase d, if you increase d, what is going to happen to the position of the first principal minima, or uh, first minima? is going to what? Going to become smaller. 
right? So suppose I have a, a, I have a gap here, and I, I'm shooting, shooting the gun like crazy, okay? And they produce huge amount of uh, bullet, all right? Which I don't recommend to do that, for sure. What I'm going to do, what I'm going to get is a distribution like this, which are the bullets passing through this wall, all right? If I increase the size of the wall, the distribution I'm getting is becoming what? Wider. Right? But the result here is actually surprising. Why? When you increase the width, okay, when you increase the width of the D, this function becomes smaller. That means the central maxima will become narrower, as you can see from this demonstration. So the left hand side is an experimental setup which you have a very, very narrow uh, city. And basically, you, you get a very wide distribution in the intensity as a function of position on the, on the screen. Right-hand side is another situation where you have wider distribution, all right? Uh, sorry, wider uh, speed, and you are going to get a narrower central maximum which is actually different from the, the, the other experiment which we, we were actually doing, all right? So that's the first thing which we, we learned from here. And also, the distance, the distance between uh, the, the maxima and the minima, okay, is proportional to wavelengths. So that means I can measure wavelengths by using the position of the, the minima, okay? And we are going to do that to measure the wavelengths of the laser beam, all right? And finally, the last thing which we learned is that, okay, in the, mid, uh, in the central uh, uh, region, you have a maxima of I0, and this intensity is going to be going down proportional to one over beta square, where beta is actually defined here. It's proportional to d sine theta and the inversely proportional to, to uh, wavelengths. Okay? So now, what I'm going to do is uh, an experiment which I would like to measure what would be the wavelengths of, uh, of my laser. So I have a laser here. Oh, okay, I don't want to hear, hurt anybody, all right? So I have a laser here, all right? And I have a slit, which you cannot see, unfortunately. And I can read off the width of the slit for you. The width of the slit is carefully designed to be really small, is 0.16 millimeter, okay? This is my width. The D is equal to 0.16 millimeter, all right? And the, on the screen, you can see that there's a, there's a pattern from here, which you probably cannot see very, very clearly, so I will try to lower the intensity of the, the other source, right? So you can, you can see then, see that there's an interference pattern or diffraction pattern, which is actually shown here. So what I really need in order to uh, calculate the, uh, uh, the wavelengths is the sine theta angle, right? Which I really need the sine theta angle. Then I can actually calculate what will be the wavelengths of this laser, all right? So I, that means I will need the help from a volunteer who volunteer to help me to measure the distance between this slit and the last screen. Can somebody volunteer? Yes, please. All right. So we are going to measure the distance. Can you hold this? And uh, can you actually uh, put it? OK, try to pull this thing. And we'll try our best to make it straight. Thank you very much. OK, we don't want to destroy the experiment as well. 
All right. This is not working. OK, uh, let me do this thing the other way. So how about the okay, trial and error, right? How about this? I, you hold this, hold that thing, and I'm going to actually measure the distance from here. All right, and I need to really make it really carefully, measure this very carefully, and I don't want to destroy every, every, anything, which is very possible. All right, so what I'm getting? I get 7.5 meter. Okay, so that's actually the distance between the screen and, uh, and, uh, and the screen and the, the, the source. Okay, hold that for a second. I'm going to measure the width of the, the distance between two minima. The distance between two minima is seven centimeters. Thank you very much. So thank you for your help. So we have now everything we need to calculate the wavelengths. I'm going to clean this up first. We have what? We have the distance now. The distance between the source and the screen is 7.6 meters. All right? So now I would like to calculate what will be the lambda, right? And also I know the distance. The distance between these two minima is seven centimeter. Okay? So that means this will be 3.5 centimeter. Okay? So lambda divided by D is actually equal to sine theta which is actually small d, which is the distance between, uh, uh, between the minima. The small d is here. The small d is the distance between the minima and the center, divided by r, which is the distance between the source and the screen. All right? Therefore, I can have lambda will be equal to capital D times small d divided by r. So what is actually the answer? So basically, I have capital D, which is actually um, uh, 0.16 millimeter, right? So that is actually shown there, which you cannot see it. All right, okay, so I will use a different board for this calculation. So basically, um, we will actually get lambda is equal to capital D times small d divided by r. Capital D is 0 0.16 times 10 to the minus 3 meter, right? And what is actually the small d? The small d is actually 3.5 centimeter. All right? And finally, I have a 7.6 meter, which is actually the small r, divided by 7.6 meter. All right. Can somebody actually calculate this for me? <laughs> Anybody have a smartphone? This means that I haven't done this experiment myself and we will see what is going to happen. I hope it will work. What is actually the value? Uh, 7.36 meters times 10 to the minus 7. 7.368 times 10 to the minus 7. This is actually equal to 7.37 times 10, to, oh wait, uh, it's actually 7 uh, 7.37 narrow meter. Actually, the wavelength of the red is actually between 620 and the 750. And actually, we are actually getting the correct value 
You see? So actually now, you can actually tell your friends that although the wavelength is so small, but I can measure it with such a square pit uh, experimental setup. <laughs> OK, so that's a successful experiment. So that's actually telling you that it's a proof that it's this uh, formula, which we actually do all the crazy work of this Fourier transform in two-dimensional uh, uh, integration. It should really work. And uh, the result is actually not, from, not really far from what you can get from Wikipedia. Okay, so at this point, I would like to take a five minute break to take some questions. And we are going to come back uh, in, uh, okay, at 31. And we are going to discuss another very interesting issue, resolution. Okay, so welcome back. Uh, so there, there are um, a few questions uh, about, um, there were a few questions about the, uh, uh, the, the pattern here, which is interesting. So you can see that what we actually concluded from here is that the, the width of the, the central uh, principal maxima is actually two times of the width of the secondary maxima. All right? So you can see that the width here between these two points is actually lambda over d, but the width between the, the, these two points, which actually give you the width of the, the, the central principal maxima, is actually two times of lambda over d. All right? And that is actually can be seen from the experiment there. Maybe, OK, not easy from, for, for, for the moment. But this is the width. And the, the, the smaller structure is actually having a width half of the, the, uh, the central, um, uh, central peak. All right? So that is actually something which is interesting and uh, I would like to share that with everybody. So now we actually come back to the original question we were uh, actually uh, discussing last time. So one interesting thing we observe in this two-slit interference ex experiment is that you not only see all those little structures, right, which is actually kind of periodic structure, and they are coming from the two-slit interference, right? And you also see this larger structure, which is showing up there, right? Which is actually going up and down, and also it produces a minima at some specific point. Now we understand what is actually happening, all right? Suppose I have a two, I have two slit interference experiment, okay? Where I have the width of the slit to be uh, capital D to be very small, D, it's very, very small, all right? And the, the, the distance between the, the slit is actually called small d, which is kind of weird, but uh, you, have, uh, you have to accept that because it's on my note, all right? <laughs> and you can see that, interestingly, if this is the situation, then you have this periodic pattern, and you, you will see no decrease in amplitude as a function of distance with respect to the central, central point of the, 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 the screen, right? So that's actually very nice. However, if you consider a realistic situation, okay, where the size or say the width of the slit is not negligible, okay, it's sizable, and what is going to happen is that if, okay, let's forget about the second one for a moment, okay? We already learned that the output intensity of a single slit is already varying as a function of angle, right? So I have this pattern, right? Therefore, if you have these two uh, realistic slit interacting with each other, have interference pattern, what you are going to expect is, is that you are going to have the two-slit interference pattern modulated by diffraction pattern, right? Because originally, coming from a single slit, you already have a varying intensity as a function of sine theta, 
right? As we actually already discussed there. So, if we put all those information together, we are going to get I, the intensity, is going to be equal to I0, which is some maxima sine beta divided by beta, square of that, sine and delta divided by 2 divided by sine delta divided by 2 squared. All right? So basically, what I'm talking about is that if you have n slit experiment, OK, each slit have the same width, all right? And what you're going to get is this is actually the n slit interference pattern. All right? And that is actually modulated by diffraction pattern. All right? Where beta, just a reminder, in this summary, is pi capital D divided by lambda sine theta. And the delta, which is the optical path length difference we defined before, is k times d sine theta, and that is actually equal to 2 pi times d sine theta divided by lambda. So that is actually why when we perform the experiment of a single, uh, sorry, sorry, of a double slit experiment uh, uh, in the last lecture, we get complicated interference pattern like this, and it has very complicated structure. And now we actually understand why the structure is like this. The small structure, okay, in this case, is actually coming from interference, two slit interference. And uh, there are additional structure, larger scale structure, is actually coming from diffraction. It's coming from the very intensity of a single slit as a function of sine theta. OK? Any questions so far? OK. We are making a lot of progress. So what I would like to uh, move on is to discuss with you something really interesting. So we discuss and learn how to uh, explain uh, the interfer uh, the, the, why we have actually colorful soap bubble, right? So I have something totally unrelated. So we have a soap bubble also in the space, which is the soap bubble uh, nubra, which is very interesting. And you can actually Google it and uh, see what is actually happening there. But actually, that's actually not my point, OK? So my point is that you really need very good resolution uh, telescope so that you can actually observe uh, those uh, really beautiful objects which are already there and uh, cannot be made by human, right? All right, made by somebody else, all right. OK, so this is actually why I would like to, what I'm getting into. So the resolution is really something important. So when you take a look at this uh, picture, the resolution is not very good. So right, you can see now the peak position of two nearby peak is actually connecting to each other. Then what do you see from this picture? You see maybe a lion? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe not, right? But if you improve the resolution, what do you see? It's actually Libra, right? <laughs> OK? So this is actually the kind of thing which we were, would like to discuss with you. We are actually touching this important uh, phenomena, which is actually needed uh, for uh, observing uh, in interesting uh, 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 phenomena, which is actually happening really far away from the Earth. What is actually the resolution? And uh, we are going to talk about that as well. And uh, I would like to show you another interesting example. So this is a comparison between not-so-serious uh, 
picture and the, the picture from Hubble telescope, okay? So I was using uh, some telescope with D equal to 40 centimeter, and that's actually the best thing which I can achieve, shutting the same uh, plenary uh, Nubra M57. Uh, that object is actually 2,500 light year away, and you can see that I cannot get really a lot of detail from this image, all right? And now, if you compare that to a D equal to a 240 centimeter uh, Hubble telescope, and also at the same time, this thing is actually above the atmosphere, right? So that's actually very, very important. And you can see that you do get a much, much better resolution, and you can actually see all the fine detail, very, very fine detail of this image. And we are in the position to understand uh, the resolution and the limit uh, which we can have for, uh, 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 I mean, uh, due, to the, due to diffraction, actually, all right? So if I consider now a pinhole, all right, with diameter uh, equal to D, all right? So right now, what we are actually doing is not a single slit anymore, but, but a, a hole with, radi uh, with uh, radius d over 2, all right? And we can do the same, exactly the same calculation using this formula, but I'm not going to do that uh, for the sake of time, all right? So we can do exactly the same uh, C function calculation, and the, what we are going to get is i as a function of theta is equal to i0, j1 beta divided by beta squared, where j1 is the uh, Bessel function of the first kind, all right? Sounds really scary, but it's actually not, right? So what I really need is the is the, the zeros of the Bessel function, right? So that I can actually extract the interference pattern and the width of the central maxima. So now, since we are having a pinhole, basically all those things are, the, all those patterns are actually two-dimensional. And the, I was wondering what would be the needed uh, 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 beta value so that I can actually reach the minima, all right? Why is that important? That, that is actually telling you the limit of the optical resolution, right? If I have two peaks which are actually placed too close to each other, like what we actually see in the previous slide, then we can actually not separate very well these two light source, right? On the other hand, if the distance between these two peaks is larger than the first minima, then I can actually be very safe. I can actually separate. I can say that, ah, this is two peaks, two stars, two light source. I can tell, all right? So that's essentially why this is important. And where is actually the, the, the minima? And I can already solve that for you. And that is actually when x is equal to roughly, the numerical value is roughly 3.83, all right? So that's actually not important. Those numbers are not important. The, the important result is really the conclusion. So, so beta is equal to 3.83, and that is actually equal to pi d sine theta divided by lambda, right? So that is actually our original definition. And I can solve what will be the sine theta, which is actually telling you the position of the, the, the minima, right? So sine theta, all right, will be equal to actually 1.22 lambda divided by d. So what does that mean? That means the position where you have the first minima is actually happening when you have sine theta 
This is the theta. When you have sine theta equal to 1.22 times lambda divided by d. OK? So that is actually very nice, doing exactly the same exercise. And we now understand where my min minima is. Then that is actually telling you something about the resolution. So what I'm going to uh, try, trying to get into is that now let's design a, a form together, a mobile form together. All right. So what is actually the width of the human pupil? It's actually the width is actually roughly two to four millimeter uh, when narrow. When you see a lot of light all over the place, or three to eight millimeter. All right, so that is actually the typical lens when when uh, when wide. All right, so that is actually the width of the pinhole. All right. So typically, the visible light, as we calculated, is something like 500 nanometer. Right. And the width of the uh, human. Uh, Pupil, or we can actually uh, take a number of five millimeter. Okay, and now we can actually uh, try to give input to uh, to the phone design. So, what will be the resolution if we take these two parameter together? So, basically, the resolution of your eye, we can now calculate that, right? So, what is that? That is actually one point two two times 500 uh, uh, nanometer divided by, uh, OK, my function is uh, OK, it's d, right? So divided by d is equal to 5 millimeter. 5 millimeter, right? Basically, what you are going to get is 1.22 times 10 to the minus 4. This is actually the resolution sine theta roughly equal to theta is actually equal to 1.22 times 10 to the minus 4. All right? I have an iPhone 6 or 7, whatever you have. Basically, it's 401 PPI, right? 401 PPI is actually, what is that? Pixel per inch, right? All right? So what is actually the delta x? So if I have a phone, okay, it has a camera there, okay, that is that is my phone, <laughs> and this is my eye, looks like an eye, right? The distance is twenty centimeter, right? I do this, which is unusual, all right. <laughs> so what is it? Okay, we have we have four hundred ppi. So what is actually the delta x? The delta x between the pixel, the delta x is equal to 2.54 centimeter divided by 401, and that gives you something like 6.3 times 10 to the minus 3 centimeter. All right? If I am trying to be healthy and I do this, all right, then what is actually the delta theta? The delta theta is delta x divided by 20 centimeter, and that is 3 times 10 to the minus 4. If you compare this value to the limit I calculated here, you can see that what is the conclusion? Can I resolve the pixels? on the form? The answer is yes. OK, so that means this form is not good enough. They have to do more work, OK? <laughs> and now I'm going to design a J form. Maybe sometime, at some point, I got really crazy, and I decided to open a company, which is Yenji's form company. And of course, I would say this is J form, right? Because it's Yenji, all right? 
and I'm going to put 40,000 PPI in this form. Will you buy it? Uh, one dollar. You buy it? Yes. <laughs> Maybe you will buy it because you are my student, right? But it's not worth it. Why is that? Because you cannot resolve this uh, kind of fine uh, uh, or small distance between pixels. So it's actually useless. Okay, so what is actually the limit? You can also probably give that to your friends. 2,000 pixel per inch is mm, roughly the limit. Beyond that, maybe the next generation of our students will be using this like this. Then it works and it's worth it. All right? You can actually read this, this, this distance. Doesn't work for old people like me, but uh, for young people it works. All right, so very good. So that's another thing which you have learned. So finally, as I promised you, we are going to go back to this business of designing the enterprise for Star Trek. So what does the enterprise do to their friends? They shoot laser beam, right? And uh, try to attack the other ships, okay? And uh, what I'm going to do now is to calculate for you what is going to happen. Okay, now I have this laser beam here. And uh, in principle, before you take AO3, you are going to say that, ha, I can shoot uh, uh, the moon, and uh, this light is going to be really narrow, and uh, it's going to hit the moon, a very small area on the moon. All right? Do you believe that now? I hope the answer is not. How crazy is this idea? What is the size of the spot? Can you guess? Is that one millimeter, 10 meter, or 200 kilometer? How many of you think by now is one millimeter? Nobody, oh, fortunately. How about 10 meter? One, two, Three, okay, three of you. How about 200 kilometer? You believe that? Really? The answer is really 200 kilometer. It's the size of misery state. <laughs> all right, so now you can see that this is not practical at all, and you have to really do what? Increase or decrease the radius? Increase, right? By the end of this lecture, everybody get this idea. Okay, thank you very much uh, for, uh, uh, for the attention, and I hope you enjoy this lecture.